This video is sponsored by Endel. You can train your brain just like you can train your body. And in many ways, training your brain will have a far bigger impact on your performance and your everyday life than will training muscle strength or other similar physical properties. Now there's some contention around things like brain training programs, but the truth is the issue isn't that you can't train your brain, it's more that we don't know precisely what the best input is. This is something we're gonna be talking about in this video specifically when it comes to training the working memory, which is a crucial aspect of our cognitive performance. And by improving your working memory, you can process more information, think quicker, come up with better solutions to problems, even have a richer experience of the world around you. This is something that's a particularly personal journey to me as I'll explain in a moment, but it's something that I've made a lot of progress with. And in this video, I'm gonna explain how you can process more information by training your working memory effectively. So for those who haven't watched the previous videos on this topic, working memory is essentially your brain's RAM. This is where you store information in order to manipulate it. So for example, if you need to write down a phone number, then you hold that number in working memory after you've been told it as you look for your pen. Likewise, if you're performing maths, you use your working memory to hold onto the numbers and carry numbers over as you're manipulating that information in your mind. However, we now know that working memory is a lot more complex than that and also a lot more nuanced. In particular, that's because working memory is cross-modal. It isn't just a matter of storing numbers or storing words, it's also a matter of storing images and sounds and even your body's position in space. And you don't just store these things in these separate compartments, you combine all of them to create a more vivid and accurate picture of the world around you. So for example, if you're a football player and you're running down the pit trying to remember where all the other footballers are and where the ball might be by the time you get to a certain point, that's using a working memory to store that information in your mind's eye. When you're having a conversation, you use working memory to store the context of everything you've just said so that you know what to say next. It goes far deeper than this though, because we actually also use working memory to literally experience the world around us. When you look at something, when you see a scene in front of you, you're not really experiencing that scene directly. You're experiencing your brain's representation of that scene. And interestingly, that representation is actually quite different from the reality. And we use our working memories to do this. That's because so much information is coming into our brain at any one time, simply from our visual field alone. There's no way that we can process all of this. And in fact, the resolution of our eyes gets lower and lower as you move away from the center, from the fovea. So what we need to do instead is our eyes dart around the scene, taking small snapshots of different individual things that we can see. It then glues those things together in the working memory to create our visuospatial landscape. It combines this with sounds, which it will identify with particular images and your position in space. And at the same time, it needs to stitch all those things together with your assumptions, with your schemas, with your long-term memories. A great example of this is dreaming. When we dream, we have no external stimuli with which to update the information that we're juggling. Therefore, we create entire worlds simply based on our working memory. These are fragile, impermanent creations held together by our sheer brain power. If you look at the time, look away and then look back, you'll find that the time has changed because you simply can't hold on to that much information all at once. This is kind of what happens in our waking life. The only difference is that we have the ability to look at things, to update that information and create a slightly more accurate picture of the world around us. So as you can see, your working memory is partly responsible for your entire richness of experience. If you can't stitch together as much information, then you have a more limited understanding of the world around you. It might even be linked with consciousness itself. And at the same time, it can have a huge impact on things like your performance in sports, even in driving. Your working memory could be really a limiting factor and make you more dangerous on the road. What's absolutely crucial to effective working memory is focus. And that's why I'm very pleased to introduce today's sponsor, Endel. So Endel is an app that creates personalized atmospheric soundscapes to not only help you focus, but also to help you to relax, to improve your creativity, to help you to get to sleep. These are backed by scientific research and studies show that using Endel when working can actually improve your focus versus using a Spotify playlist. And what's also really cool is that the soundscapes are AI generated and they respond in real time to things like the weather, the time of day, and if you have a compatible smartwatch, they'll even respond to your heart rate. And they have really cool collaborations with different artists which are really experimental and interesting to listen to. And if you use the link in the description down below, Endel are giving away a free week of sound experiences so you can try it out for yourself. Thanks once again to Endel for sponsoring this video and now on with the show. So can we train working memory? Well, our brains are highly plastic. We know that they're capable of forming new connections and new neurons late into adulthood, something that we didn't used to think was possible. This means that in theory, we can train our brains just like we can train our bodies. But as with training our bodies for things like sports, there are some caveats here and some 
real nuances in the way that we approach this training because we need to train in a way that has transfer, near and far transfer. That is to say that if you perform a brain training program and it's just making you better at that brain training program, then this isn't necessarily gonna improve your everyday life. We need to find brain training activities that actually transfer to better performance in waking life. And this is where the issue really comes in. You can't just do lots of bench press and expect to be able to do full planche. We need to train with specificity for the goal that we have in mind. In the same way, you can't just perform, say, a dual MBAC test and expect this to improve every aspect of your brain function. So again, for those who aren't familiar, the dual MBAC test is a program that challenges you to remember numbers and to identify them in a sequence. Dual MBAC has been shown to improve things like task switching, which is really useful under the right settings. At the same time, it's been shown to improve focus. However, another study found that it doesn't necessarily improve overall fluid intelligence. And the issue is, hopefully you've already guessed, that we're just training with numbers here when we've already seen that working memory involves all of our senses working together. So at the same time, I'd be very surprised if performing dual NBAC would actually improve your ability in sports, for example. So we want to look at something slightly more useful in that regard. So we might turn to something like 3D object tracking. And here you have to track different objects in your visual field. There's a bunch of good ones. I really like React Performance Trainer, which is something I've talked about on this channel before, and I play it often. However, this is going to improve your visual spatial landscape. And I don't know quite how much transfer it's going to have to things like your ability to perform maths sums. The cool thing is, studies suggest that 3D object tracking can improve things like player accuracy in football. But another study found that doing 3D object tracking didn't even transfer to other 3D object tracking tasks. So the results are a little bit mixed and that was just for one 3D object tracking program, we really need to look at the bigger picture here. And at the same time, I also find we need to look at other aspects of working memory because it's not just about capacity. It's not just about how much can you store in your working memory. It's also things like persistence in the face of distraction. So in other words, you can store that information in your working memory, but when there's a noise in the background or when someone's trying to get your attention, how easily can you hold on to that information when you want to? This is why it's personal to me because I have a lot of difficulty actually switching between tasks. I have this kind of absent-minded professor persona and I find myself being quite slow to respond when someone speaks to me in the street and I'm not expecting it. I can be witty in a conversation where I'm one-on-one -on -one and I'm really focused on that conversation. But if someone just says, hi, Adam, I'm like, yes. And then I feel like a complete awkward weirdo as they walk off scratching their heads. Likewise, every time I go to watch TV, I'll sit down with my wife and kids and I will just stare at the screen whilst I try and remember which app I'm supposed to be using. It's because I'm thinking about something else and I struggle to clear out that information, it seems, and then focus on something new. As a kid, I was actually put in the assisted learning class because I was so disorganized. And it's a really odd and persistent issue with my own brain function. I'm just saying it hasn't held me back in life, but it is a big glaring issue. And I'm actually even looking into the possibility of ADD or something along those lines. So perhaps training working memory could help me to overcome some of these limitations. Just like I might say, I don't have as much mobility as I like, and so I'm gonna train mobility specifically. So this has led me to want to improve my own working memory so I can be quicker in these kind of tasks. And more specifically, I wanna be able to process more information quickly, I want to task switch, and I want to generally be more alert and switched on. So to do this, it might be helpful to first look at how working memory actually works. And of course, as is always the case, no one really knows. There are lots of different theories, but there isn't one that everyone can agree on. What we do know is that there probably isn't like a separate brain region, a separate store for working memory. Descriptions of working memory such as the visuospatial scratch pad might have once made us think this could be the case. But as we now know, working memory involves lots of different senses and essentially you're keeping those neurons active in the absence of external stimuli. So in other words, you look at something or you imagine something and that lights up areas of your brain as though you're still seeing it. And then your job is to hold on to that image by still focusing on those neurons, keeping that activity going. And this might be reliant on what we call reentrant loops. In other words, the brain is looping around to keep specific brain regions active so you can maintain the image of what you want to concentrate on. Brain imaging seems to confirm that this is what's going on to the extent that we see increased fidelity in the image stored in working memory correlated with increased brain activity. So the more we can activate the brain regions that help us to visualize or hear or work out a sum, the more information we can experience. These loops likely involve the frontal regions of the brain, along with the posterior cortical areas and subcortical structures as well. However, the precise brain areas being utilized likely is determined by exactly the nature of the task. This is called the component processes view of working memory. And it's just one leading theory, but essentially it says that we need to use lots of different brain areas, creating a kind of loop to keep those active so that we can maintain the image of what we're trying to hold on to. And it's backed up by some studies that show that damage to certain brain areas can lead to deficits in certain types of working memory specifically. So in other words, we want to use all the different brain regions. 
However, like I say, there's no consensus on precisely how working memory works. For example, some models of working memory suggest that it requires fast Hebbian plasticity in the span of milliseconds. That's to say that the brain is actually rewiring itself using the same rules it does for longer term plasticity in real time as we're thinking. This is quite amazing to imagine that the brain is literally rewiring itself as we think. Whether or not this means we don't need activity in the brain as well, and some models are activity silent, suggesting that we don't need constant firing in the relevant neurons, that's up for discussion. But what we can take from this is that there is a kind of loop necessary. Working memory isn't just in one part of the brain, it's dispersed across different brain regions. And so we need to train not only those individual brain regions, but also the connectivity between them. So looking now at something like dual NBAC, we can see why it's not enough because we're just using one aspect of our brain's function. This is why coming up with apps and tasks for ourselves that involve multiple aspects of our working memory could be the best way to improve our cognitive processing speed and capacity. For example, we know that juggling has been shown in studies to increase gray matter in brain regions responsible for sports vision. Because here you're not only using proprioception to move your hands and arms and to consider your positions in space, you're also tracking the movement of the balls with your eyes. So there's a lot more information here for the brain to juggle. However, at the same time, we could up the challenge here by placing ourselves on a wobble board, for instance, and then having ourselves answer maths problems whilst we're doing it. Now we're using multiple different brain regions all at once, and we're trying to avoid distraction, hold on to multiple pieces of information. I think that this could provide a much more intense stimulus in order to encourage that kind of brain rewiring. This is something I'll be trying, and I'd love for you guys to try it as well, and we'll make it an experiment. And you guys could let me know in the comments down below whether you have any luck with it. Alternatively, we could also apply this to creating brain training programs, but trying to improve their effectiveness by thinking in terms of multiple different sensory inputs, in terms of progressive overload, intensity, and all these things, challenging not only capacity, but also persistence against distraction, etc and put it all into a single package like that. I think virtual reality makes a lot of sense for this because it has a much wider field of view because it takes into account your movements as well. However, I do think we could achieve this to a lesser extent with an app, for example. So I've built an app myself that I want to share with you guys. You can find a link to it in the description down below. It's completely free. However, if you would like to donate some money towards it, I'm going to include one of those kind of pay what you want buttons. So yeah, if you want to buy me a coffee to say thanks, then that'd be much appreciated. So here's the app. I'm calling it Biomind because I'm a nerd. It's in a kind of incomplete state. I've been working on it just over the last couple of days, haven't had a lot of time. So, you know, in, in future, I'd like to add to this and build on it. And if you check back to that page, then I should have, you know, newer versions coming out. I might also upload it to something like GitHub so we can work on it together. It'll be open source, so maybe I'll include the source files. But what we have so far is a game with four different modes. And the first mode is the simplest. You have to count two different colored squares and ignore a third color of square. Every time one of those colored squares reaches seven in total, you tap the corresponding button. That will set that lot of squares back to zero, and you have to keep track of the other lot of squares at the same time. I mean, in this case, it's not that much different from dual N back. And indeed, this is not a perfect solution by any means. I just think it covers a few more different things than dual N back, as we'll see. Scenario number two is similar. You're keeping track of three different squares. However, in both scenarios, you also have distractors. These are colored squares that pop up that you need to ignore. Scenario three is where things get more interesting because here you not only are counting two different colored squares again, but you're also ignoring a colored square, but you're also counting the total number of squares. So when a green square crops up, you need to ignore that as a colored square, but you need to count it towards the overall total number of squares. This is where your brain starts to really struggle, or mine does anyways, because you're juggling different types of information. You're counting in a straightforward manner, but you're also thinking in terms of semantics and what it means. And you're updating different information. You're avoiding distractors. You're switching between different tasks. And this is why I think it is a little bit more comprehensive, maybe, than just dual end back. Then in the fourth condition, you're tracking squares again, but you also have sounds. You have to identify when the sound is, say, an animal versus just a random sound. You have to do this on top of also keeping track of the squares. This is quite basic at the moment, so it's not a million miles beyond dual end back, but hopefully you can see the potential for it because you could also have it where you're, you know, looking for numbers that are even versus odd at the same time of tracking squares of certain colors and total number of squares and also sorting different sounds out. So there's lots of different things you could be doing all at once using different senses. And like I say, because we're not just updating one data set, because we're juggling multiple, it's a bit more similar to how we use working memory in real life. But we don't just get to focus on one thing, but we have to switch between those things. Before we go, I also wanted to touch on a couple of things we can do in the short term to quickly boost our working memory. One of the most important things is 
tackling stress, because stress actually inhibits activity in the prefrontal cortex, which can impair a lot of working memory. This is why the other day when I tried to collect my wife's prescription from the doctors and they asked me her date of birth, I just froze because I mean, apparently I'm that socially anxious that that alone was enough to create enough stress that I couldn't access this thing that I genuinely do know. I do know my wife's birthday. I do. In a more serious situation, we might imagine a fighter pilot who's perfectly capable of operating the many, many controls that they need to steer their craft, but when they're under fire, suddenly all that falls out the back of their head. This is called cognitive load, and it's something we need to consider from a design point of view. Just because something is easy to use in the moment, is it easy to use under stress, at which point our working memory is severely blunted? This also means that caffeine can actually blunt working memory. We think of caffeine as a neuroenhancer, as a neurotropic, but actually, whilst it can improve working memory for basic tasks, as the cognitive load gets greater, the impact of caffeine becomes more negative and actually impairs performance. So if you drink a ton of coffee, especially if you're already an anxious person, you're actually gonna become more jittery, less focused, less quick to respond, all the things you would imagine that caffeine would help with. So in some ways, working memory and focus are so intertwined as to be almost inseparable. And meditation, of course, can help with this greatly. However, like I say, we also need to be able to switch attention. And this is why I think that meditation on its own might not be enough. So there you go, guys. That's working memory in a nutshell and how we can improve it based on what we know so far. I'm going to be trying the things I've recommended here. I'm going to invite you guys to do the same and I'd love to know what your results are. If you found this interesting or useful, then please leave a like and share it around. These videos don't perform anywhere near as well as my exercise tutorials, but it's something that I want to keep doing. So if you like this kind of content, then please share it around. I greatly appreciate it. If you're interested in training the brain and the body, then you might enjoy my ebook and training program, Super Functional Training 2.0, which also comes with over two hours of instructional video. That has a brain training component and the exercises are chosen specifically because they have a cognitive benefit as well as a physical one. So if you're interested in this kind of thing, check it out. I'll put a link in the description down below. Either way, thank you so much for watching this one, guys, and I'll see you next time. Bye for now.